once again, we're indeed happy to have as our guest speaker, Mr. E.R. Harper, Evangelist of Abilene, Texas. Last week, Mr. Harper began a series of lessons on the theme, The Church the Prophets Saw. Continuing that theme, today's topic will be The Church in the Eternal Purpose of God. And remember, you may have a free copy of this lesson by writing to The Church of Christ, West Monroe, Louisiana. Write today and ask for the lesson on the church in the eternal purpose of God. And now, Mr. Harper. Thank you and greetings, my friends. Our subject today is the church in the eternal purpose of God, a continuation of the general theme, the church the prophet saw. Is it an emergency substitute for God's prophetic kingdom failure? As we all know, the excuse given for the so-called church age is that God's original purpose for Christ's coming the first time to fulfill the kingdom promises did not materialize. It failed and was postponed. Israel's having rejected Christ as their king, defeated God's original plans, and he called Christ back to heaven under the second coming, at which time, they tell us, God will certainly make good his kingdom failure promises. How they know he can succeed next time, when he failed the first time, they've never yet explained. This so-called failure left a vacuum between Christ's ascension back to God and his second coming, which had to be filled. This period they now call an interim church age period. It is now 2,000 years old. To fill up this vacuum, this interim period, they have God calling Christ back to heaven. While God sets up the church as an emergency substitute for this prophetic kingdom failure. They call it the church age. This would give God time to reorganize his heavenly forces and set the stage for a second attempt at making good his kingdom failure promises to the seed of David at his first coming. For certainly, if the kingdom had to be postponed, something went wrong or the kingdom promises would have been fulfilled. Our question for answer now is, was the church really an emergency substitute for God's prophetic kingdom failure, or was the church in God's eternal purpose, just as was the kingdom? This is the question. It must be answered. This future kingdom doctrine does not allow for the cross of Christ, nor the church, either one of them to have been a part of the original purposes of God for sending Christ to earth the first time. In a book, The Kingdom of God, by the late R. H. Bowl, he states, The church is an unexpected aspect of the kingdom. From this, if God had expected his kingdom promises to fail, the church would not have been an unexpected aspect of the kingdom. The reason given by them for God's failure to set up the kingdom is tragically pathetic. They teach that Israel rejected Christ as their king, and this defeated God's plans. Therefore, the church as an emergency substitute for God's prophetic kingdom failure was born. Did Israel accept his church? Did she? Did Israel not also reject Christ and his church as they did Christ as their king and also his kingdom? Didn't they? This must be answered, but friends, they can't. But I must answer their rejection theory. It'll be so easy. Please get your Bibles. In Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 33, is the parable of the householder. The householder had a vineyard. He let the vineyard out to husbandmen. We might call them renters. Now the household of the vineyard returned. He was the heir, said the Bible. Well, they said, let's kill him. He represents our Christ in this parable. His workmen had not produced the fruit they should have. The householder asked them, What shall the householder do under these husbandmen? They represented Israel. Well, sir, they replied, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard under other husbandmen which shall render him the fruit in their season. Now here the householders answer to them, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to another nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Of whom was Christ speaking here, friends? Verse 45 gives the answer. 
And when the chief priests and the Pharisees had heard this parable, they perceived that he spake of them, that is, of Israel. Yes, God knew Israel would reject Christ as their king. This did not defeat God's eternal plans laid from the foundation of the world. This is the truth we must learn. It caused these husbandmen, rebellious Israel, to be rejected back then. But it crowned God as a victorious conqueror over all his enemies. God and Israel's rejection of Christ as their king all worked out before Christ came. He was to take the kingdom from Israel and give the kingdom to another nation. They did not catch God napping. He was ready. From the foundation of the world he'd been ready. In 1 Peter chapter 2, this other nation to which this kingdom was to be given is described as being present during the apostles' day. To the people who in 1 Peter chapter 1 purified their souls in obeying the truth and who had been born again by the word of God, the apostle in chapter 2 verse 9 called them this holy nation. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 16, our Bible calls the churches in Galatia the Israel of God. This unanswerable truth is recorded in Romans chapter 11 verse 7 regarding this kingdom. It reads, Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. Now why? You see, Israel was looking for the earthly kingdom of David just as are the premillennialists today. Then our Bible reads, but the election hath obtained it. That is, they received this promised kingdom, and the rest were blinded, says our Bible. You see, those who did accept Christ as king received the kingdom promised. The spiritual kingdom of Christ is here now, and men are actually born again into it by water and the Spirit. So declared our king, Christ Jesus. John chapter 3, verse 5. I shall now establish by the New Testament the absolute fact that Christ came to earth for the express purpose of establishing or building the church. This was the part Christ was to play in his first coming. God's part was to give to Christ the kingdom and throne of David. Christ was to reign over the church, which is the born-again ones of this earth. Then we may know Christ was to build the church. I now read from Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Christ says, I will build my church, singular, just one. The church is the only house Christ ever built for the name of Jehovah, just one. I now invite you to listen as I read to you from Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1 through verse 12. In this is the answer. It once and for all establishes the truth that the church is not the result of a postponement of God's kingdom promises, nor is it an emergency substitute for his kingdom failures. It is not an unexpected aspect of the kingdom either. The church was and is the fulfillment of the eternal purposes of God promised by the Old Testament prophets to the seed of David, our Christ. That this is true, listen now to Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. As I wrote before in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, that's before Christ, was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed under his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. I stopped long enough to ask this question. What was that mystery that in other ages was not made known to men as it had then been made known to the apostles? Well, Paul did not say it had not been made known to the men of other ages. He said had not been made known to them as it had then been revealed to the apostles and prophets of his day. The answer to the question, what was this mystery, is the foundation upon which I shall rest my contention that the church is not an emergency substitute for God's prophetic kingdom failures. I deny the prophetic church 
was a substitute for anything. It was the thing itself from the very beginning. Now, beginning with verse 6, we have the Bible explanation of this mystery in these words. It was that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body Paul called the church, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. This was the hidden mystery of ages past. Now explain the how the Jews and Gentiles could become one fellowship and be of the same body that Paul called the church and partakers of the promises in Christ by the gospel after 1,500 years of separation had remained the mystery throughout the centuries past. Now it has been explained. Notice this takes place in the church by the gospel that the Jew and Gentile were both to be one fellowship in Christ. This forever settles the question, was the church an emergency substitute for God's prophetic kingdom failures? It was not, for it was decreed in prophecy long before Christ came to earth that the church, this prophetic house of God, should be the plan, the only plan, by which both Jew and Gentile should be united into this one fellowship. In verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 3, Paul declares that it was because of this mystery I was made a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me whom less than the least of all saints is this grace given. Now why, Paul? I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now listen right good, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Notice now, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Here it is stated that this prophetic church plan had been hid in God from the beginning of the world. It was not a substitute for God's plan gone wrong. It was the plan itself, ladies and gentlemen. The church was in God's plans from times eternal. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. Now this destroys premillennialism completely. It destroys their special church age theory during an interim postponement period from the ascension of Christ until his second coming because of his rejection by Israel. The church was God's plan from the beginning of the world to save the world, both Jew and Gentile. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6, just read. This question must be answered. It must be explained by them. Why was Paul now preaching this fellowship of this age-old mystery being just at that time explained to them relating to Christ and his church? Now hear Paul's answer as to why he is preaching this, this mystery to the intent, or that is for the purpose, that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. My friends, my very dear friends, God had foreordained, predestinated, and predetermined from the beginning of the world that he would by the church and through the church make known not just the wisdom of God, but the manifold wisdom of God by the church to a lost world. Tell me then, the church came in as an unexpected aspect of the kingdom, or as a result of God's postponed, sworn prophetic kingdom promises that it failed? Oh, no, my good friends. The church was and is God's plan through the ages, from the beginning of the world, to complete God's eternal purposes. For oh, our blessed Bible records in Ephesians chapter 3, this same chapter, verse 11, these words, that it was according to the eternal purpose, which he, that's God, purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is no other way. There is no other plan. Yes, the church was in the eternal purpose of God, and verse 9 declares it was hid in God from the beginning of the world. The church is no substitute for anything. The church is the thing itself, my friends. You may ask the question, Mr. Harper, when did this church begin? Oh, it began in AD 33 in Jerusalem, as recorded in Acts chapter 2. Thank God I'm a member of that church. 
Now that you may know, this was the church in Acts chapter 2. I now read from Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And at that time there arose a great persecution against the church. There it is in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2 was the first Pentecost after the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord. That you may know beyond doubt, I know what I'm talking about. Let me read to you this time from Acts chapter 11, verse 15. Paul referring, or Peter referring back to Pentecost in Jerusalem, as he was defending his going down to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, as it did upon us at the beginning. When did the Spirit fall upon Peter and the apostles? In Jerusalem, on Pentecost Day, A.D. 33, following the resurrection of Christ. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 to 4. He called that the beginning. Here in Jerusalem, A.D. 33, this mystery came to life. It was unfolded for them to understand. What was the mystery? The church, God's uniting place of both Jew and Gentile, and was planned from before the beginning of the world. I close with this question for the premillennial reign advocates to answer. How long was this church to last after its beginning in Jerusalem in A.D. 33 of Acts chapter 2? Just until God has time to set up his kingdom that failed and was postponed, and then the church will end? Well, let our Bible answer how long the church shall last after it is set up. In the same chapter, Ephesians 3, verse 21, our Bible answers this, Unto him that is under God, be glory in the church by Jesus Christ. How long, O Lord, throughout all ages, world without end. Here our Bible declares the church age that began in A.D. 33 was to last until the end of the world, world without end. Our Bible is right, friends. Good people, after the end of the world, there can be no thousand years more for their millennial reign of Christ on earth. The world will have already ended. There are not two separate ages, the one the church age and the other the kingdom age, separated by millions of uh, millenniums. My good people, both the church and the kingdom began in Jerusalem on Pentecost Day, A.D. 33, recorded in Acts 2, and shall run concurrently, that is, at the same time, under the end of time or until the end of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 23 to 24 says, Our Bible reads that Christ's second coming, he shall deliver up the kingdom to the Father, not set up the kingdom. To deliver up never did mean to set up. Thus I prove the church the prophet saw is not an emergency substitute for God's prophetic kingdom failures, but that it was in the eternal purpose and plan of God. The church is a thing itself, as seen by the prophet. It is not the result of the postponement of God's kingdom promises. But, be listening next time, as I prove the prophetic coexistence of the church and the kingdom, that is, they exist at the same time. Now, may God bless you, until our next study is my prayer, in the name of Christ, my King. How I wish he were your King, but, if his kingdom is not here and will not come until the second coming of Christ, then you cannot be in his kingdom. You cannot be born again. Ah, oh, my friends, how tragic this postponement theory. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard E.R. Harper, evangelist of Abilene, Texas, discussing the subject, The Church in the Eternal Purpose of God. Free copies of today's study are available upon request. Write today for your free copy of the lesson on the church in the eternal purpose of God. Be sure to join us again next week at the same time when Mr. Harper will continue his lessons on the general theme, the church the prophet saw. And be sure to invite your friends to listen to the program as we study together from the Word of God. If you would like a further study in the Bible, we would be more than happy to send you our free Bible correspondence course. Write to us today and ask to be enrolled in this interesting study of the Bible. You may write to Church of Christ, 
West Monroe, Louisiana. And now, until we meet again on this same station at the same time next week, <laughs>